Just as there may be ages or time periods of genius, so, of course, there may be corresponding places of genius. Here's an interesting book on the topic, Geography of Genius by Eric Weiner. The ages of genius, as we have seen, occur in places in which the sciences, arts, and social ideology move forward in a new direction and new cultural values take shape. When something is new, obviously, it occurs for the first time. It's an original from the original Latin origo, and from which we get, again, from the Latin ab origine, aboriginal, from the beginning. But how important is it to have an idea first? Can you be a genius if you are the third or fourth person to think of something impactful? Remember my definition of genius. A work of genius must be something that is both original and impactful. Again, you're encouraged to have your own definition of genius. Original, creative, impactful. However, those are adjectives that I, at least, associate with genius. But how do you prove your originality? How do you prove that you got there first? In poetry? philosophy, music, film, literature, and the arts generally. If you want to do that, you claim a copyright. Thereby, you establish the right to prevent others from copying your original idea. In science and technology, you file for a patent. Thomas Edison acquired 1,093 patents. Here's the one for his famous phonograph. But when did we get this innovation? And it is an innovation that we might patent or copyright an idea. When did this notion begin that the genius or anyone had rights to their intellectual property? Copywriting written material seems to have begun in England and Scotland in 1710 when the common parliament of those two countries issued the Copyright Act of 1710 also known as the Statute of Queen Anne. As you can see from a reproduction of that document, the act was announced as, quote, an act for the encouragement of learning by vesting the copies of printed books in the authors or purchasers of such copies. And I think here by purchasers, they mean publishers, during the times therein mentioned, end quote. Soon, similar copyright laws were instituted in other countries in Europe, as well as in the United States. Patents also had a long history in Great Britain and the United States. Letters patent had been granted in England under Queen Elizabeth. The first patent law in the United States was passed in 1790, and the first patent was issued in New York City on July 31 of that year, and was signed, as you can see, by no less than George Washington himself. You see it listed as patent X000001. The intellectual justification of such laws can be found in the philosophy of the time, in the works of English, French, and German philosophers who valued original thinking. A philosophy of genius gave rise to these copyright and patent laws. On the screen you see, in brief, the thoughts of a few important people on the subject of individual original genius. Scotsman William Duff from his essay on original genius. Quote, by the word original, when applied to genius, we mean that native and radical power which the mind possesses of discovering something new and uncommon, end quote. Voltaire said, if he be not original, he is not considered a genius, end quote. Denis Diderot, the man of genius has a way of seeing, of feeling, of thinking that is unique to him alone. And Immanuel Kant, quote, everyone agrees that genius must be considered the very opposite of a spirit of imitation, end quote. To repeat Kant, genius is the opposite of imitation. The notion of individual originality came to have three distinctive qualities. One, an original idea could, in fact, arise from the mind of a single person. Two, that original idea could belong to that person. It was personal property, intellectual property. And three, that person's intellectual property 
was worthy of protection under the law by means of copyrights and patents. All three of these aspects of originality gained a secure foothold in Western countries, particularly Britain and the United States, at precisely the time when capitalism in the West came to be the dominant economic system. Henceforth, individual initiative and capitalism go hand in hand in the West. Ideas, including those of genius, could be ascribed to not generally a king, a country, or a society of people, but also to a single individual. And those original ideas could be exploited for financial gain by that individual or his agents. Genius, originality, geography, and money. Let's play with these concepts for a moment, and let's start with a test, one that I invariably give my undergraduates at Yale just for fun. On the screen, you see six objects. Three of them have been sold at auction for at least $5 million in U.S. money within the last few years, and three are pretty much worth nothing. Here we assume, rightly or wrongly, that monetary value equates with worth, perhaps even original genius. A questionable thesis, I know, but just play along here for a moment. You choose three images, each worth $5 million or more. Okay, now the answers. Number four is just something I pulled together off the internet. It's worthless. Numbers one and five were painted by a monkey. So presumably, unless you're a collector of monkey paintings, these are also worthless. Number two is a famous creation by contemporary artist Jeff Koons. Number three by Andy Warhol, as you may have guessed. And number six by the famous Jackson Pollock. Well, how did you do? Now I'm going to show you two images by Pollock. Which do you prefer? Which would you want in your living room? Take a moment to decide. The one at the top we've seen before in the previous slide. All right, now I have to tell you the truth. I lied. The painting at the top is not by Jackson Pollock, although it did sell for millions of dollars at one point. It's a forgery of a Jackson Pollock. Below it, is an authentic Jackson Pollock, one currently in the Yale University Art Gallery. The painting above, which I, I'm embarrassed to say, <laughs> prefer because of its greater color, is a forgery now worth only a couple thousand dollars. As soon as it was discovered as a forgery, its value went from millions down to about zero. The real worth of the real painting there of the Pollock is, well, your guess is as good as mine. 30 million, 40 million, 50 million for an original Pollock of this quality and size. The painting at the top was painted by Pei Shen Quan, an artist who copies the works of others. It was sold at the prestigious Knoedler Gallery in New York City at the behest of convicted con artist Glafira Rosales. This forgery was part of an $80 million art fraud. The Canodla Gallery is now out of business, and Ms. Rosales was arrested and convicted. Pei Shen Quan, the expert copyist, has moved back to his native China. The notoriety of this art forgery caught the attention of ABC News. Let's watch a bit of their investigatory report. $80 million scandal that has the art world up in arms tonight and collectors checking their most prized possessions. ABC's chief investigative correspondent Brian Ross tracks down the man at the center of it all for our series Nightline Investigates. On the streets of New York, the business of fakes and knockoffs is thriving. Fake $200 Ray-Ban sunglasses for $30. This Fake $2,000 Louis Vuitton handbags for $75. Fake $10,000 Rolex watches for $80. If you found something good, this is good. Nobody can tell the difference. Original or fake? Nobody could tell the difference. I couldn't tell the difference. All right. 
Let's see some more of this clip about originality and forgery. The accused forger created lookalikes of some of America's most prominent artists, including the late Mark Rothko, whose iconic blocks of color sell for millions of dollars. This real Rothko sold for $56 million in May. A perfect time to turn out the fakes. Here are images of a real Rothko and a fake Rothko created by the accused Times Square forger. Okay, I'll give you a chance to redeem yourself. Which is the real Rothko and which is the fake? Okay, now let's continue. The real one on the right sold for $3 million. The fake on the left actually sold for more, $8 million. <laughs> That's funny. The fake sold for more. All right, let's journey to Shanghai with ABC News and meet our skilled copyist forger, Pei Shen Quan. His name is Peixing Kim, and he talked for the first time on television about the fakes and the investigation with Meg Chuchmat of ABC News. My intent wasn't for my fake paintings to be sold as the real thing. They were just copies to be put up in your home if you like it. Kim was paid between five and $8,000, according to the indictment against him, for paintings which later sold for millions of dollars. If you look at my bank account, You'll see there was no income. I'm still a poor artist. Do you think I could be involved with this? Ken has admitted he forged the signatures of the painters he copied. Yet he insisted to ABC News he was stunned that so many people in the art world would be fooled by his fake Rothko's and Pollock. So what do we learn from this? Perhaps we should ask ourselves again, why do we value a work of art? Is it a work of genius because it gives us aesthetic pleasure, because it, it's original, or both? Does knowing that something is an original offer some strange sort of pleasure? Seems as if we Westerners value, in monetary terms, originality almost above everything else in science and in art. But let's stay in China for a moment. The Chinese often assign value consider something a work of genius, not based on originality, but rather on the degree to which an artist is able to do homage to, to venerate a tradition by copying it. Copyright and patent laws are only very recent additions to Chinese civilization. There was no such thing as a state patent office in China until 1980. Indeed, copying things is part of a venerable Chinese tradition. Here we see a painting by Chang Dai Chen, who is called the Picasso of China. The painting is not, however, an original conception. It's a copy of another centuries old painting. But the painter, Chang Dai Chen, and this painting are highly valued in China. And even Chang's copies sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars. The fact that copying things is an ancient tradition in China, but perhaps a punishable crime in the West, points out how different these two cultures are historically with regard to the concept of and the value placed upon originality and intellectual property. A final thought. This Western notion of defining genius in terms of originality is, surprisingly, a comparatively recent development. The ancient Greeks who first talked about genius didn't think of genius and originality as synonymous. They thought of genius only as a poet who would be overcome by the spirit of some other great genius like Homer and write like Homer or in the Homeric tradition, but not write in a radically different original way as did, say, Shakespeare or James Joyce or Gertrude Stein. Thus, the notion that genius presupposes originality is not only unique to Western culture, it emerged in the West comparatively recently. It took full hold in the West, gained full force in the West only 250 years ago during the 18th century, at the same time as did the capitalist economic system.